gold prices had recovered from 2015, but no one really cared in the U.S. And then all of a sudden, 2019, you know, things have begun to change. Otis Gold Corp. is a gold development and exploration company with quality projects in the pro mining state of Idaho. Otis's flagship Kilgore project has a resource of 961,000 gold ounces, and its recently published preliminary economic assessment demonstrated an impressive post-tax IRR of 53% at $1,500 gold. In addition to the significant expansion potential at Kilgore, Otis is exploring its highly prospective Oakley project. This Carlin-type gold deposit already has an inferred resource in previous near-surface drilling inter at 123 meters of 0.69 grams per ton gold. Otis Gold Corp trades in New York under the ticker OGLDF and in Toronto under the ticker OOO. That's triple O. To learn more, go to otisgold.com. That's otisgold.com. Welcome back to Mining Stock Education. Thank you for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bill Powers, your host. If you'd like to engage the show with your questions, comments, or feedback, feel free to reach me at bill at miningstockeducation.com. Well, today we're going to be discussing the markets, precious metals investing, and more. And I have an expert on the line. Since 2008, David McIlvaney has served as, a, as the CEO of McIlvaney Financial Group, which includes the International Collectors Associates and McIlvaney Wealth Management. His thoughts on gold and the markets can be heard on his popular podcast, McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. Has over 20 years of involvement in the wealth management industry, and he is the author of The Intentional Legacy, a book that I recommend. I read that book about uh, two years ago. With that being said, David, welcome to the show. Hey, Bill. Great to join you today. So you are heavily involved in uh, the precious metals business. I'd like to begin by getting your thoughts and observations on what you have observed in the last six months, and in particular the last four months as gold has been ri rising. Uh, what can you tell us about the demographics of the type of people People that are becoming more interested in precious metals? That's a good question. You know, we've been in the precious metals business. You mentioned ICA. That's uh, 47. We're now in our 48th year of business. And so watching the people come and go into the market tells us a lot about where we're at in a particular cycle. And as we looked at 2017 and 2018, we saw a lot of interest in Europe and Asia, not a lot of interest here in the United States. So traffic was very light. In 2019, uh, both in terms of the sort of retail purchases of metals as well as the traffic into ETFs, you did start to see a, a shift uh, in 2019 here in the U.S. So it went from being just a global thematic where gold prices had recovered from 2015, but no one really cared in the U.S. Uh, and then all of a sudden, 2019, you know, things have begun to change. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure uh, what the trigger is. It could be sort of the language of, of you know, negative rates and low rates becoming uh, more universal. Uh, we've seen massive volatility in, uh, the, in, in the fixed income space this year in the U.S. Uh, you know, if you look at the 10-year treasury, we were at 2.79 earlier this year. It dropped almost in half uh, to 1.477, massive volatility in the fixed income space, uh, kind of unusual. So, um, we, we think there's going to be a lot more traffic in the gold space as, as we see some pretty critical levels in the S&P and the Dow and the NASDAQ. They need to hold. They don't hold. You're going to see a lot of people looking for um, gold as a safe haven. So um, we could finish the year. Certainly 2020, 2020 looks uh, very uh, positive from, from that perspective. Don't know that the, whole, the, the stock market can hold together quite that long. At the bullion sales level of your business, what would it take to really attract the average Joe or the average Susie to give you a ring and, and inquire about purchasing the physical precious metals? Yeah, if I had to choose one thing, if one thing shifted, it would be the S&P and Dow moving lower because it, that's kind of a litmus test. People don't necessarily track you know, non-farm payroll numbers or you know, looking at purchasing managers indexes, people don't really care about the beige book, all these things that tie to sort of important uh, fundamentals within the economy, people don't care. People don't care. What they care about is, yeah, is the stock market up or is the stock market down? That's my litmus, the average guy's litmus for if we're okay or if there's trouble. So you really don't have the motivation, the drive for investors to be moving into gold until that litmus, until that one thing is telling them, uh-oh, uh, there, there's, there is problems on the horizon. So in spite of all the talk about trade, and certainly there's a clear understanding of a weakening global economy, 
you can ignore it all as long as you're sitting within, say, a 5%, 10% range of all-time highs for the, for the Dow, for these major indexes, the Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, et cetera. So that, I think, is what would drive the average guy into um, buying physical metals uh, with, 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 with a lot of energy. Could you see a hard currency reset and that being linked to gold? And then, of course, the gold price would be revalued higher. This is a forward-looking statement you're going to make, of course. But what is your outlook here in terms of a hard reset or possibly a soft transition into whatever the economic system looks like after all these fiat currencies are dealt with and devalued? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, the, the reality is fiats are devaluing. And from 71 forward, we haven't had... Uh, a standard by which to compare any currency. So they're all moving lower. And the only benefit you have is looking better on a relative basis to the, the, the neighbors that you're being compared to. Um, so that devaluation continues to happen, um, but it's really not noticeable because, it, it, again, where's the plumb line? What tells you that you're off? I think to some degree, gold tells you that you're off um, but to th consider your question, the hard currency reset, um, I think the sensitive thing there is politics. And the, the sensitive thing there is, is, is fiscal responsibility. You're talking about having to first change 535 seats back in Washington prior to gold being a possible uh, candidate. For, for being included in our, our, our currency system. Because what, what gold does when it's a part of a currency system is it ties the hands of politicians and, and reckless spending. So now you're, now, I mean, there's an implicit discipline to a hard currency standard, and it's a discipline that politicians do not like. They will occasionally uh, assent to it, but only when their jobs are on the line. So you're talking about a tremendous amount of social and political chaos which would precede their openness. They're very close-minded to it because, again, it represents sort of shackles on their ability to, let's, let's call it what it is, it's, it's buying votes. When you, when you go to your constituency and say, I'm going to give you this and we're going to do that and here's how we're going to bring home the jobs to the state, this is what it looks like, they're spending somebody else's money. And, and when, you, when you can run massive deficits, which you, you can almost with that consequence, um, and that was that was Jacques Roof's contention: deficits without tears. Uh, his argument in 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 the Monetary Sin of the West, a uh, book that he wrote back in the seventies, uh, maybe it was sixties. But th this this idea of discipline is anathema to politicians. There's your there's your major crux in terms of returning to a gold standard: is the environment has to shift fairly dramatically uh, and be very very difficult. Uh, for their their minds to be open. One idea that I've had is how could that change occur? You and I are both U.S. citizens, although there's people from outside the U.S. that are listening to this conversation right now, is that there would possibly be some sort of travesty or hard economic fall, and then the the desire and the call for honest currency, the U.S. dollar again linked to gold, would have have to come from the people to which the politicians would then respond. I mean, that's kind of how I've seen it. Otherwise, it would be a Ron Paul type figure that doesn't care. He campaigned on end the Fed or even a Donald Trump in his second term. If this is in his purview and desire, that would be rogue enough to go ahead and try to make the change. Uh, what are your thoughts here? Well, by personality, Donald Trump has the perspective to get it done. I mean, he just doesn't care what other people think. So if it makes sense to him, it makes sense to him. But what he's conveyed, at least in a first term, is that he wants a cheaper currency. And as we've seen with the Swiss franc uh, over, over the last, pick any time frame, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, they've had some gold backing. And obviously, that's been curtailed massively in the last 15, 20 years. But they're still treated as a reliable currency. They're still treated as a quote unquote hard currency, even though they're hardly a hard currency anymore. And it attracts investment dollars. The stability attracts capital from all over the world. And it boosts the value of the currency. And that's where Donald Trump would say, not only no, but probably hell no. Because he wants a cheaper currency to be able to be competitive in terms of global trade. So again, he has the, the brash personality. He's not a Washington insider. These are some things that are well, at least the wash, not being a Washington insider, that's that's refreshing to me um, and would put him in a position to, to carry that torch. 
But to date, he said cheaper currency. And I don't think he would tempt fates with the U.S. dollar becoming a, a really strong currency again, like the Swiss franc, if, if gold were, were, were part of that. How do you see the interaction, because you also advise your clients, uh, of GLD and holding physical gold? If you're dealing with someone that has no exposure to gold, uh, number one, what percentage of gold exposure would you like to see them have in their portfolio? And then would you break that down a little between GLD or would you go only in physical precious metals holdings? Well, let me just say at the outset, um, I think we've been a fairly a fair broker on this question because from 2008 to the present, we've been very comfortable with GLD, SLV, SGOL, any number, CEF, any number of exchange traded funds or proxies for the price. And we're in the process now on our wealth management team of eliminating every single one of those exposures. Now, part of the reason is that, you know, in this phase of 2008 to the present, I've, I've been fairly comfortable with the ability for these funds to get delivery of the metal, put it in storage, and 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 there, you know, in other words, trade settlement has occurred. There is gold there, and and that's that's been easy enough to document. I don't think that in the next two three years we want to tempt fates with their ability to uh, still operate settling gold, you know, purchasing gold in the futures markets, and then settling that in physical format to a particular depository. I do not believe that there's going to be uh, as, as, as much strength in those markets. And I think, you know, you want to make sure you've got the physical. So we, we, we have both businesses. Our, our precious metals brokerage focuses on the physical tangible asset. Um, our asset management company, McIlvany Wealth Management, focuses much more on uh, precious metal stocks. And, and that's where we've made the decision. In terms of risk and reward, we would rather own precious metal stocks as a growth play. We're done owning GLD, SLV, and, and the other price proxies. If you want the real thing, own the real thing, and, and know that there's nothing, stand, no institutions standing between you and the metal you purchase. Now, that may mean that you do store it with an institution, but you need to have clear legal title to that asset. And, and so that's where, you know, looking at bailment agreements and, and, and how storage arrangements are constructed, you're in the you're in the first position, nobody else, and I think that's a, that's a really important thing to focus on. So yes, I like physical precious metals. Um, put them in an IRA, great. Uh, take physical delivery of them, great. Our most recent offering is called Vaulted, and it's been around for a year. It's in direct cooperation with the Royal Canadian Mint, and from your smartphone or computer, you can buy a kilo bar or some part of a kilo bar and use that as a savings and banking alternative. Uh, very inexpensive way to own gold, same cost structure as GLD, only you can take delivery of your bars. It's, 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 a, it's a great program, and we designed it not actually to be a, a quote-unquote gold position, but I look at the banking system and think that people need an alternative uh, place to, to keep a, a, a cash equivalent. Kilo bars for me come as close to a cash equivalent as you can find in the gold space. Silver One Resources is an exploration and development company backed by strategic investors Eric Sprott and SSR Mining. The company is focused on its Candelaria Mine project in Nevada, where there is already a historic resource estimated at 127 million ounces of silver. The Candelaria Mine historically was the highest grade silver producer in Nevada, generating over 68 million ounces of silver at an amazing average production rate of over 1,250 grams per ton. The project has tremendous expansion potential as past drilling has outlined deeper, high-grade silver targets for future drill programs. Silver One is highly leveraged to the price of silver and is cashed up and poised to increase shareholder value. Silver One trades in New York under the ticker SLVRF and in Toronto under the ticker SVE. To learn more, go to silverone.com. That's silverone.com. Your vaulted product could uh, really appeal to millennials and those that are younger that want the easy access to buy and sell. There was a, a Glint Pay, which I'm sure you're aware of. This is it was a product recently launched that was doing something similar. They just declared bankrupt, bankruptcy a couple weeks ago, and that kind of brings yep. up the idea of counterparty risk. So even though you own the company vaulted, you basically are that counterparty for the people that are, are buying gold through that 
what are you doing to truly protect those that I'm going to use the word invest in vaulted because Glint Pay went bankrupt? Yeah, I think one of the things to keep in mind with Glint as as a as an organization and as a structure is they came from nowhere. They, you're not talking about someone who's been established in the gold business with relationships with deep pockets. Uh, they had to raise investor capital. And as soon as you start raising outside investor capital, you're bringing in a certain set of expectations up to including interest payments on the money that you raised. So that means your clock is ticking. You have to be successful within a certain period of time, get cash flow generation up to satisfy investor expectations, or it's game over. So they, you know, kind of a flash in the pan story with Glenn, interesting product compelling a sales pitch as it related to that. Uh, but you're talking about a business structure, which was not sustainable dealing with other people's money. Uh, you know, what we have with vaulted, we created this organically. We can continue to fund it organically. There's nothing here that puts our business at risk. And in, by the way, it's, it's a pass through in terms of the ownership. When someone wants to take delivery of the gold, you know, we help facilitate the transaction, but there's no liability structure between the client gold and what's sitting at uh, at the Royal Canadian Mint. We're not connected uh, in in that way. We're facilitators. We have a a a, a, um, a technology platform that allows for that to happen seamlessly. Better trade settlement than a stock transaction. Uh, so if you want to either add to a position using an ACH, you could do it as an automatic savings program. And at the end of a month, you say to yourself, I got a bill to pay. Liquidate your gold and it's back in your savings account, your bank account to write a check for this or that uh, in two days. So, you know, we are we're, we're a facilitator of gold ownership in a digital era. And we still care about the real physical thing as we have for almost 50 years. So you're right. It appeals to uh, a younger generation because they don't want to be encumbered by stuff. Our experience, the greatest uh, objection we've encountered from millennials is we're on the move, we're living in smaller spaces, we don't want to be encumbered by junk. If we want access to a better savings program, a better denominated asset, or even gold, uh, in this case, they can call it anything they want. Maybe it is for them their gold position. I think of it as savings. But if this is their gold position, easy to buy and sell, cheap to own, um, great product. And I, and I think it opens up the conversation for a whole new generation of gold investors. What's the difference between vaulted and gold money, another popular um, service people use? I think the first thing is it takes you about a minute to open an account with vaulted. Uh, gold money, I, yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time on their website just trying to figure out how to open an account, how to place a trade. You, when, you're, when you're talking about a digital platform and you're talking about digital natives, people who want to engage, you are talking about a time frame that matters. Try it. Go to vaulted.com. See how long it takes you to open an account. I, I am not a genius when it comes to IT, and it takes me less than 60 seconds. So the whole platform is designed to be user-friendly, and, and I don't know how this has been missed by some of our competitors in this space, uh, but it's very difficult very difficult to get anything done. Uh, tedious process, multiple steps, page after page. Uh, great. I mean, it, that works for them. Great. But we intend on taking the space by storm uh, because the product is user-friendly, very easy, and we're dealing with the best. I, I think one of the things that we also care about that no one else in the space cares about, including gold mine, um, is conflict-free gold. We do care about where gold comes from, and I don't want it coming from somewhere in, in, in the dark heart of Africa. If, you, if you're talking about children being forced to mine gold in uh, the Congo, and that's showing up in the United Arab Emirates and being processed into nice pretty bars in Switzerland, and no one caring about the provenance, I will tell you we're different. We're different because we care about where the gold came from. And the Royal Canadian Mint is the only place we've been able to find who will certify every ounce as conflict-free. Have you noticed an interest, uh, an increased interest from millennials since launching this project? Oh, yeah. I mean, the the, the, the rate at which we're opening accounts with Vaulted uh, is we've met all of our first-year expectations. And I think we're well on track to meeting our second-year expectations 
uh, in terms of accounts opened. And I think a part of it does come back to this ease of use, the functionality, uh, and the, the transparency with which this whole thing was set in motion. People want to know what their fees are up front. People want to know that they have gold. They want the, again, accessibility is one thing. Transparency is another. Conflict-free gold. These are all things that I think set vaulted aside or apart in the industry. And I think it would explain why, why we're, we're seeing good traction. Months ago, David, I read an article by an investment manager, and he said that he would say of the millennials that he's dealt with in his business, about 90% prefer Bitcoin over gold. Uh, what do you think we could do to bring down that uh, percentage? Well, I think the merits of Bitcoin are similar to gold, but there's a whole host of risks that make it a dramatically different kind of asset class. Uh, the millennials also are, are and, and, and I don't, I mean to categorize by one group, anyone interested in the cryptocurrency space, I think you'll find 10% who like the, the technological disruption and, and what is happening from a, from a tech perspective. Everyone else, if they're honest, only cares about cryptocurrencies because of the increase that they've seen in price. This is like a moth to a flame. Talk about any bull market in any asset class, everyone's interested at a certain point if the rate of return is compelling. I'm sorry, if you go from, you know, I know some folks that bought Bitcoin at less than $2 and have, have done very well selling it at 10 and at 12 and at 15 and at $19,000 per, per Bitcoin. Most of your interest didn't come at the front end. Most of your interest comes in between 10 and 20,000. And now they're holding on to hope that it's not just a $10,000 or $20,000 asset, but could be $250,000 per coin. Again, why are they interested? Are they interested because of the fundamentals and because of the disruption that is potentially in this uh, blockchain technology, or is it that they're chasing price and return? And, and if that's the case, then recognize that like any other, uh, you know, not just bull market, but speculation, um, people get sucked in because of sort of a get rich, uh, whether, whether they can process this and, and account for it personally, is where, where a lot of investors are not, frankly, very self-aware. But I think most people who are involved or interested in Bitcoin today or other cryptocurrencies, uh, it's, it, it, really, it really is kind of the get rich quick scheme. And your interest in precious metals, as I understand it, uh, kind of stems from your dad and the discipleship you had growing up. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think gold can go up, and I think it can go up a lot. That's not its primary benefit. To me, it is it is a way of mitigating risk in a portfolio, and I view it as insurance. Uh, gold tends to do very well when other asset classes are suffering. So looking at a, at a value equation, uh, when do you want to have liquid capital? When everyone else is capital constrained and prices are cheap. That defines a bear market in equities or real estate or anything else. I'm interested in gold because I'm interested in every other asset class on the planet. I want to own infrastructure. I want to own uh, farmland. I want to own stocks and bonds, but I want to be able to access them at reasonable prices. And they're typically most reasonable when gold's doing well. And again, this comes back to kind of sort of an emotional component within the markets People are ebullient and excited about stocks and bonds when the price is going up and prices get bid higher. And gold does nothing. It's, it's not important in that environment. And then when the opposite happens, when people are desperately afraid, when they're afraid and, and are losing value, whether it's in a 401k, IRA, what have you, or in real estate, whatever the asset is, they just want their money back and it'll be at any price. And that's, again, where I like the fact that gold is a reliable store of value, and it represents to me the perfect form of liquidity, which with I can use as cash, in a cash equivalent, to buy other assets. So if you take a long-term view, and this is the benefit of being in business for 50 years and having a father that raised me with a certain conversation about money and finance, there's times that you want to own gold and own a lot of it. And there's times that you want to own a little bit of it but not as much as you did before. And you need to be using it as cash for purchasing other assets. So what's the quality of the assets that you want to own on the other side? Do you have your wish list? Do you know what that is? This is why what we do in terms of our wealth management group and what we do with our metals group, I think there's such a beautiful symbiosis where there's times that you want to own a lot of equities and times that you need to be very, very careful. And, and so this back and forth, the interplay, I think, is, is helpful for our investors. 
David, I recently had a fund manager on the show, and he said that whenever he's feeling really good about his mining stock picks, he sells some and he buys real estate. Uh, with that being said, uh, and you look for real assets, not just gold. You're not just a, a gold bug that wants to put all your money in, as you've just articulated. But what are some other opportunities in real assets that you might be able to share with the listeners? Yeah, Bill, you know, I think when we define uh, hard assets or real assets, it, it includes at least four categories. And precious metal stocks are, are one of those areas. And we're talking specifically how we see things and the way we do things on our wealth management side. Um, we're not interested in everything. We're not interested in Tesla or Amazon or Microsoft. As, as valuable as those assets are in a particular cycle, we want to own things with intrinsic value. And, and so that's going to limit the, the list of companies, 25 to 40 companies that we want to own. And it's going to fall into these categories of precious metal stocks, of global natural resources, of global infrastructure, and, and, of, and of global real estate. Uh, and I'll tell you, there's a couple of those categories that are very difficult to allocate capital to right now because the prices have been pushed pretty high. Now, we're glad to own them because we've seen the appreciation. But if you're putting new money to work, particularly in real estate and infrastructure, it can be very difficult because <laughs> like almost everything in the markets today, uh, there's there's sort of a pricing for perfection. David, you mentioned uh, many of your services and companies you own. Could you share that information with listeners? Yeah, so the ICA, as you mentioned, is, is our precious metals brokerage company. Uh, McIlvany Wealth Management is uh, our wealth management company. And, you know, you can go to McIlvany.com. Um, McIlvany.com will allow you to link to kind of everything that we offer. Um, that, that'd that be the easiest uh, sort of place to, to get started. I, I, Bill, like you, I think you have a passion for educating and through our weekly commentary, McIlvany Weekly Commentary, it's on iTunes, any place you listen to, 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 to podcasts. We've done that weekly for 11 years. So over 600 episodes, conversations dealing with the nuts and bolts of the financial markets. We're not limited just to the financial markets because, of course, financial markets are impacted by a lot of things, whether it's psychology, or politics, or geopolitics. We end up having a very fascinating conversation that brings a lot of these things together and helps make sense of the world so that investors can be making, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, you can make better decisions. You can make wise decisions. And on occasion, somebody says, you know, I like the way these guys think. And I'd love to partner with them. I'd love to work with them. Maybe it's opening up a precious metals IRA, or maybe it's opening up a wealth management account because there's something intuitively appealing about our thesis, hard assets, real assets, intrinsic value, inflation protection, having a hedge against what we consider to be unsound monetary policy, credit expansion, which is kind of unprecedented in, in, in global history. Will we ever see any consequences of that? How do you invest in light of the crazy world that we're in? Um, it's not easy. It's not easy, Bill. And as I mentioned in the introduction, David is the author of The Intentional Legacy, What You Want for Your Family, Why You Want It, and How You Get There. This is a book I read a couple of years ago, which I would recommend. deals with the idea of legacy, what is wealth, some of the ultimate ideas beyond just making money. So I do recommend uh, that book as well. David, I really appreciate you coming on Mining Stock Education and sharing your thoughts. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Bill. Have a great day. Osino Resources is a Ross Beattie back gold exploration company in mining friendly Namibia. Osino's district scale land package is situated near two producing gold mines, one of which Osino's management team previously developed and sold to B2 Gold. Osino's founders and management are experienced mining professionals who have already successfully developed and sold two companies in the past seven years. Osino has an excellent shareholder base with Ross Beattie owning 20%, Insiders 5%, and Resource Capital Funds 8%. This is an exploration company with drills turning that you'll definitely want to pay attention to. Osino trades in New York under the ticker O-S-I-I-F and in Toronto under the ticker O-S-I. To learn more, go to OsinoResources.com. That's OsinoResources.com. Thank you for listening to this Mining Stock Education Podcast. Please subscribe and share with like-minded investors. Visit us on the web at miningstockeducation.com for more resources on precious metals and natural resource investing. At our website, you can also sign up for our free newsletter for interview transcripts, stock picks, and more.